I'll, I'll start by saying this is my voice. <laughs> so if you want to hear, come to the front of the church. <laughs> Move up. Plus, if you want to see all the numbers come up. Steve has only gone through this one time, so bear with him. I'm going to interject, but he's going to deliver the most. Okay. Okay. Well, this first slide uh, it breaks down the farmland ownership in 2014. Statistics of farmland acres in the U.S., uh, the percentage and the, and the amount in Iowa. You see uh, there's a lot in Iowa, almost 31 million acres of farmland in 2014. And uh, the term, we need, really need to get this in your heads, NOL is non-operator landowner, NOL. I'm just going to call it NOL. It's the non-operator landowner, which is what we are. We moved back to Maggie's uh, family farm in June of 2012, and we've been there since we retired from uh, city work, and, uh, and that's where we are. So, um, so the, you know, the null owned acres uh, of that 911 million is 283, uh, which is 31 percent in the U.S. In Iowa, it's higher than that, though. It's 41 percent. You see, 12 point, almost 13 uh, million acres. Um, the actual number of non-operator landowners, NALs. This does include um, individuals, but also uh, corporate entities, trusts, and other uh, things that the law, the law looks at as persons. Uh, they, they really aren't, but you know, we know how that is, it's legal constructs. So uh, all of them, uh, almost two million in the United States, in almost 85,000 in Iowa. Um, but when you break out the principles, the key individuals in those, those groups, um, that's that 1.4 million U.S., uh, 65,000 plus in, the, in, the, uh, in Iowa. Now, the rent that's paid to the Nalls is almost $3 billion. Um, in Iowa, in Iowa. So there's a lot of that going on, this relationship between uh, landowners and operators that contract with them. And uh, something that's not on the slides but in your handout, if, if you are a null in Iowa and own 200 acres, you have a, over a million dollar asset at the average value of land in 2018. If you have low quality land, it's just less, it's like 800,000. And if you own top quality land, it's $2.2 million. So you have a significant asset, and a lot of people just rent it out and don't pay attention to the land. Okay, the next slide. Uh, Oh, okay, it's there. Um, these principal uh, nulls are, tend to be kind of old, like us. <laughs> Maggie's 67 and I'm about to be 66. So, so we're right up there close to the average age of you know, 68 and a half years. Um, and uh, they own the seniors, we old folks, uh, own 70% of the rented land uh, tend to be college educated. We actually fit with that. Uh, male, 58%. Female, 42%. Um, farm experience varies, but um, most, not most, less than half, uh, never farm, but 45% uh, actually have. Or they're retired. Um, and you know, on, we nicknamed our, our, uh, place, uh, resilient farms. We had to do plural because resilient farm was taken by somebody. So we're, we're really not, we don't have multiple farms. <laughs> we just have one, one place. But um, 
this is and this is kind of outline of what we're going through farm goals our conservation priorities and a incorporating conservation actually into a lease with the, with your operator um, progress that we have made so far and uh, our future conservation plans so we'll we'll get into those um, in 1899 uh, je and retta taylor purchased the farm they named it pleasant prospect uh, they built uh, some swale terraces and planted evergreen windbreaks um, judging by the condition of our pine trees, it looks like <laughs> they were original. <laughs> they Quite are, a few they dead. Are, they're a hundred years old. They're old. But they're our, old. our farm has a long tradition of conservation before conservation was even a concept. Anyway, their grandson, Earl McQuown, uh, acquired the farm and uh, used multi-year crop rotations, corn, small grains, cattle, pastures and added added some ponds um, it tends to be what it is is just east of us is a river valley where the town of Red Oak sits uh, the East Nishinabotna River and as you move west and across uh, our property begins is just the beginning of the rise of a, of a ridge to the west that uh, so it's a hilly we have a huge east facing slope that we we have to deal with in a creek so but uh, of course they had to uh, or they didn't have to but they did do contour and no-till uh, they added a couple of terraces and tile and a grass waterway in that big sloping east sloping uh, uh, field and um, in the 1990s a couple Brian and Lisa Huff they're about 10 years younger than we are. Um, uh, they became operators, and they've, they've pretty much done nothing but farm, uh, you know, their whole lives. They met in high school, married, and started farming and doing various, various things. And they worked for uh, Maggie's parents, and uh, during the 90s, uh, they added a CRP grass waterway on the property. And... Um, 2004, they, uh, Mag, um, Maggie's mom signed a 10-year conservation stewardship uh, program, CSP. And this is at the very start of CSP. My brother, my brother learned that this was a new program, and we signed up like the first two years. And this is a, a map of the uh, property uh, as it was in 2009. This is, this is after when my mom passed away, we had it um, yep. appraised for the estate. And what we had here, here's the home site, the building site. This is woods. We have a creek that runs all the way across the farm. Here's our waterway, one acre. Um, Hang on, the, the slope is basically. Yeah, this. The, the river valley is. This is east. Right so, the, okay. This part of the farm is flat. This starts to slope, and that, that's on a hillside. Um, but it, this right here, that was the CSP prairie, but the deer ate everything. <laughs> um, terraces, and this all this area was grass when I was growing up, and there was a fence line all the way along here. But they took that out, so then we got this huge eroded um, grass waterway. It just never held anything. And all my best soil is up here. So now all my best soil was down here. <laughs> yeah, it was a grass waterway in the, in the, the wishes of her parents, yeah. but, but it wasn't, wasn't really so, much of one. So for any of you that live in the Prairie Potholes area, you know, deal with this. Here's what I deal with. Um, oh, back, wrong right, button. Yeah. Um, here, here's my best soil on the flat and my best soil on the highest ridge. This, this is all 12 to 14. Well, it goes, goes from 6 to 14 percent slope. So we got a lot of sheet erosion and 
the worst. Uh, oh, my voice came back. <laughs> the worst soil is right in here, and you'll see that's where I put up, we put our prairie. Okay. Can you guys hear any of this? <laughs> <laughs> I think they can. Yeah. Okay. And so our biggest our biggest uh, problem is erosion. Uh, the, there are some examples. This was a six inch <laughs> rain event, and this. That, that's our creek, what it looked like. This is the bottom of that eroded waterway. You can see there's no grass in that grass waterway. And here's where it crossed into the creek. This is one year later, a four inch rain event. And we had just planted soybeans and they were this tall. And this is the erosion in that west field going down the hill, all the way down the hill. And there, there's where that waterway goes into the creek. Yeah, it was a mess. Um. Yeah. So that, when I inherited the farm, that's what I started with. And my mother, bless her heart, my dad died in 1990. She sharecropped farm with our farmer until 2008 when she passed away. She marketed the grain, she made decisions on it, but she just didn't have the effort to do a lot of conservation, and it was rented land or crop shared land. Yeah, she was living in town by that point and just never really went out there. Um, well, she went out every week, but she didn't oh, walk the she, land. Yeah, she, she didn't drove. Walk. Okay. Drove out through the semicircular driveway. <laughs> um, so our goals, um, and we think they're, you know, they're worthy, um, you know, to be good stewards. Uh, one of the reasons we came back here is, uh, back to, to, the, to live there, was because we didn't want to, one, sell it once Maggie inherited it, two, we did not want to try to manage it from a distance and and we were fortunately able to retire and, and live move back there so uh, and that's helped a lot uh, to fulfill these goals even develop them in the first place uh, we want to be good stewards the uh, not just to the land because every piece of land is in a watershed and that's important um, so you know, you're, it's bigger than us. Uh, our creek flows in, you know, to the N East Nishtabotna River, uh, we can tr which goes into the Missouri, which goes into the Mississippi, and stuff ends up in the Gulf. And we know that the problems that are there uh, because of uh, the entire watershed uh, difficulties. And uh, we've tried to diversify our farm practices from, uh, or we want to, uh, from two crop, uh, rotation to, to, to more diversity we, um, but we need because we don't have unlimited funds um, we have to keep this row crop thing going at least for a while um, and um, you know for income production um, and a lot of a lot of owners are in that situation so um, we have a building site of 18 acres, a bunch of old buildings, and um, we did build a new house. The first took a lot of our effort the first couple of years we were there. Um, but now that that's done, uh, we want to go on to the other, other buildings. There's a lot of things that need to be done with those. Um, and we want to create a transition plan uh, to keep the land from being divided and to continue it on a sustainable track, a trajectory that we've started that we want to see continue after we're gone. Um, in terms of our conservation goals and prior priorities, of course, we want to minimize the erosion and uh, nutrient loss, the PNK runoff. Uh, we want to rebuild and regenerate the soil, its health and permeability, and um, diversify and improve the non crop acres that we have as well. It, they're not just wasted, or they don't have to be. Um, and we want to provide uh, robust and dispersed wildlife habitat 
Um. <clears throat> yeah, we can quickly go through this. It was owner operated, of course, when my parents owned it. And then I told you my mom crop shared, so she literally was an active owner. Then in 2008 and 2009, we went to cash rent because mom was in assisted living, but it was a very low cash rent just to keep it going. Then when we took over the farm with my sister and brother, we actually have three farms. We, when we, we each own a farm, but we farm it as one operation with the same operator. We went to flex rent. We tried a couple of the flex rent where you have a base rent and a bonus above, and it just wasn't working for actually for our operator because the formula we used, he had such good yields that we got too much bonus. Um, so now we've gone to basically, it's a crop share, but it's based on cash rent. We agree upon, we use a 11 month um, average cost of the grains, corn and soybeans as the price. And then we take out operating costs and then we split the remainder. So, um, and he does all the marketing, but it's also flexible. We get, we're a multi-year, we don't renew it every year. Because with CSP, we have to guarantee that he has five years tenure. Okay, so that's basically um, what we do with leases. Oh, wrong button. Yeah, and Maggie's worked out at uh, Excel. She's very good with Excel, so she's worked out a spreadsheet that kind of takes keeps track of all that for, for everybody. Um, now, in terms of our relationships, uh, with our land, uh, with our farm operator, we, we've tried to have use these guiding principles. Um, try to share values and goals, uh, be flexible with each other, take a long-term view. That is easier, of course, psychologically for the owner than the operator. Uh, it's just there's a difference there, and it, and it'll always be there. But we try to we try to meet. Um, but, but by guaranteeing five-year tenure, yeah. mm -hmm. it, it helps him take that long-term view. And uh, share the risk and reward. That helps. Um, and have open, candid, and regular communication, which is easier since we're there. And we, we can see them and talk to them, and, uh, and that, that does help. Um, we, of course, need to respect each other and recognize kind of the differences in perspective and have flexibility and willingness to adapt and test and improve. Uh, that's particularly our operator. Uh, we, we're the experimental ones more of the relationship and he's the more <laughs> resistant sometimes to that, but, but uh, he's been pretty open. Um, and have clearly defined written roles and responsibilities in your lease. Um, yeah, I'm kind of good at, at writing contracts and dealing with contracts, so uh, that I've been a help in that. Uh, yeah, we clearly outline who pays for what, who has to spray, who has to mow, who has to things. We we do some work that um, an operator that you know an owner that doesn't live on the farm couldn't do, um, but we we try to help him out in that way. He's more willing to experiment because we take some of the load um, off of him. But. So it is a partnership, and uh, we try to make it as co-equal as possible and, and appreciate e each party's contributions to it. Um, some of our guiding principles for, for, for us, for, from our perspective as the NAL, uh, just be interested and interact with the operator regularly as regularly as you can. Make yourself knowledgeable, read and understand, try to understand what's happening. Um, not just the business side, but the, you know, the other issues. There are a host of issues that, that we're all dealing with and uh, try to be there at least a couple times a year. Um, walk the land, no problems. Uh, we're big, uh, 
proponents of flags, literally flags stuck in the ground. That, that will help your operator know, you know what you want. An example, I flag everything, if an area I don't want them to mow, an area this or that. My brother comes down, he comes about four times a year, and he goes, darn, they mowed that. I said, did you have it flagged? No. <laughs> well, um, so, yeah. and we reuse the big, tall flags. You know, the great big, tall ones that we use in the ones. Um, and once we flag something, they don't touch it. Or we also, if we find a problem area, like if we find something we want them to spray, we flag it, because how do you tell them, oh yeah, over that ridge, over there, there's this little area. Um, but if you put a flag there, you say, go over that ridge where it's flagged, do this. So flags are rare, oh, they're our best friend. And also, um, oh, there's a CEO of some company that said, how can you ever run a business and know how your business is doing if you aren't out walking the aisles of the store? So we have to walk the fence rows, walk the fields, and you've got to know what your land looks like. Yep. And of course, try to be reasonable and um, realize that uh, you know it's a long-term investment. It goes beyond you, at least from most of most of our cases. And uh, and there are some, you know, a couple of things too for the operators. As much as you can, you can uh, influence that. Uh, they really need to be up front, uh, let the owner know what is and isn't working and talk about the challenges, uh, bring up problems kind of sooner rather than later if you can, if you can and, uh, and try to be positive steward of the land even though if it's not yours. Uh, you know, try to think beyond just planting and harvesting. And, and there are a lot of operators who do care. They care and they, they want, they're thinking beyond you know themselves as well so it's interesting our operator just last week he goes i can't believe how many farmers just plant and harvest and he goes i don't want to do that i i know this land is my future so if you can build that relationship with your operator it's really worth it okay we need to run through our Improvements, we can show you what we've done and real quickly here. Um, uh, Maggie inherited the farm in uh, 2011. They finally got the estate worked out. We moved there in 2012. We installed a solar array that feeds the whole property that helped, uh, you know, cut uh, long-term energy costs. Um, the 2.4-acre riparian buffer contract we signed um, added some terraces and tile on that west slope, which is just, that's just the bear. I mean, that's, we, we've had to deal with that. And uh, uh, we fenced an area and, and created a produce garden and did our first cover crop test of 23 acres in 2013. Then we joined the ISU strips program. I think we were one of the first, first uh, owners to do that. And, uh, so Lisa loves us a lot. We, we appreciate that. <laughs> and, uh, and it's worked very well. We, we we're going to do more, uh, but we, we did uh, two f at first. And we planted, planted that riparian buffer uh, in May of 2015. 1,400 trees and shrubs. Um, Actually, four, four seven, rows 1,700. On. Well, it's a lot. Yeah, you, you lose count after a while, but it's, you know, it's... Two rows of trees uh, next to the creek, and then two rows of shrubs, and then a grass lane on on each side, and it's a third of a mile. That's what we what we did, and uh, but they're doing really well. We're really pleased. Our problem is going to be thinning you know, pretty soon, so um, uh, we seeded a couple of pollinator plots. We did another cover crop on the west ridge in 2016 added some more terraces and tile there five mini dams and uh that we redid that grass waterway to where it really is a grass waterway um, burned our prairie strips um third cover crop test we did 34 acres and then uh, we also in 2017 overseeded 
uh, our edges of our pollinator plots. You know how spraying and other things tend to creep on these strips and plots that aren't crops. So you really have to watch those edges and, and sometimes reseed those uh, periodically. Um, and in 2018, we added another terrace and redid the waterway again, actually. <laughs> Made it shorter and much wider. It's about 60 feet wide now, but it's not as long. Uh, so, uh, our, pro our problem is we have a couple of seeps, side hill seeps. Yeah. And so it, it, when we get heavy rain events, the water runs for a long time. And we... Um, prepped uh, some more uh, prairie strips and did an aerial uh, seeding and cover crop of 130 acres. Um, okay, so rem remember the map from yeah, 2009. Here's what our farm looks like now. And we have, um, this is our riparian buffer. Um, the we've redone this pollinator plot and we redid that, we added this. Um, you can see all the terraces. I don't love terraces because they're tiled, and the tile runs right into the stream. And I'll address that in our future plans. Um, here's our prairie strip, one, two. Now, our challenge, we looked at putting 10% of our cropland into prairie strips, but we just couldn't do it. And actually, Lisa's team finally admitted that on the amount of slope we have, they couldn't assure that the prairie strips would do the work of stopping the erosion. So I went ahead and bit the bullet and put in more terraces in the worst places. But these were, this was a brome. It was brome grass. Both of these were brome grass and weed because they're very rocky. And then also, this is very rocky, and this was very eroded. So we put that into CSP Prairie. And, um, and then this, because we have a big, long um, hill wash there, I put a terrace there. And this, this mini dam has tile that feeds into this, which is a wetland, and that's one of our next projects. Yeah. We have about three minutes, by the way. Okay. So. Um, well, then we okay, uh, let's just real this. quickly, our riparian buffer, that's the uh, old... This is the old creek, and we had to kill reed canary grass, so we yeah, burned, a, we burned and sprayed and burned and sprayed. That was a war. And that's what it looked like. That took a couple of years to, to get rid of that stuff. And yeah, we did yeah. it ourselves. And this is when we planted the trees. It, of course, it rained. There's our shelters. We sheltered half the trees and one fourth of the shrubs. Yeah, from deer and uh, yeah, that's planting. And uh, see it was wet that May. Uh, yeah, see, it, <laughs> it, wet, it, it was wet and cold. Look how I'm dressed, and that yeah. was May 23rd. Mm. So, but, uh, it worked. but in one year, we saw reestablishment of natives. We have arrowhead and um, milkweed reestablishing and butterflies. There it is the next fall. And note the height of this cottonwood. Okay. That's a sycamore. They're the fastest growing trees that we have, and they are fast. They're, they're just shooting. But by, by killing all of the reed canary grass, this is what we got. We yeah. uncovered. You know how nature abhors a vacuum. Well. <laughs> Some crap comes in there. I mean, I'll tell you, it's and, not all good either. <clears throat> and Steve spends a lot of time like this on the creek um, bank because we can't mow it. Yeah, it's two slopes, a lot of and them, so. And here, here's that cottonwood tree one year later. Oh, and is that a cottonwood? Yeah, yeah. okay. And no, that, yeah, no, sycamore. That's, That's a sycamore. A sycamore. Right. But we have there, cottonwoods too. There's our button bushes. They're doing really well. We love them. We love our button bushes. Um, here it is one year later. Yeah, we had to do some spot spraying and we oh, try yeah. to... Mid-contract, um, we sprayed reed canary grass, Canada thistle, things like that. So we're constantly fighting the reed canary grass. Okay. Yeah, strips, strip. that's, uh, we planted, we borrowed a Pheasants Forever 
cedar and uh, planted them initially. And uh, that's Maggie standing the, in. The area was too, too steep to really mow comfortably. And also, we couldn't get at it very well and turn around with tractors. So we used oats as a nurse crop. Yeah. We've had really That's good. That's what you see there. We've had great luck using oats as a nurse crop. So in areas where we can't mow, and we already had part partridge pea right away. There's the next summer. Yeah, that. Rattlesnake Master. Is a That's my favorite that was in plant. There. Those, those were really cool. And, uh, and you can see how it's progressing. And you, um, this shows you, here, here is the margin of the strip with the row crop there. And we keep getting foxtail because of spray drift. So we yeah. keep overseeding. But to see the butterflies we're getting. And there's our burn. That was, of course, uh, on um, with soybean stubble, not corn, and yeah. it was winter, and the wind was from the south, uh, which blew it along the strip. Yeah, which along the strip. Helped. And here's 27. It went up like that. It didn't take long to <laughs> to, to burn it. And um, ISU just did a plant audit, and we. We have all but three or four of our 32 species have been identified, plus ones that we didn't plant. It's time. Okay. We <laughs> so uh, cover crops. There's our. We did a bunch. You know, our cover crops and stages. I, and I cut uh, the tests were on top of the ridge where the good land is, and then we moved down. I added this to the last test, and now we're doing the whole farm, all all row crop. And we seeded two years with helicopter, and then we've moved to airplane, and the results with the airplane are better. And future plans here, we're going to, we want to do a saturated buffer where this grass waterway comes down along the riparian buffer. want to restore, we've got some invasive trees in this upper part of the wooded area of the creek. And this is a dilapidated fence line we're going to convert. And this is a rocky outcropping and rocky outcropping. And then we're probably going to convert more of this area. And then this is a wetland. And these are that's the dilapidated ponds with a wetland we're going to work on. So those are our future plans. Yep, till we die or are unable to work, that's what we'll be doing. And all, all these resources are in your handouts. So, you know. Good afternoon. Thanks for staying till the very end. And thank you to Sally for inviting me out here from Santa Cruz, California to come into this beautiful snow. And I've been too scared to drive, so I've been getting rides here. <laughs> but I got to drive tomorrow. So, uh, whoops. How'd that? Is it? Okay. So I'm just going to sort of just talk and not do a lot of teachy kind of, you know, bullet point stuff, just storytelling. Um, and thank you to Maggie for collaborating on this. It's just a total pleasure, you and your husband, Steve. And uh, um, short farm history. So uh, this could be an hour long right here. Um, my father became a doctor, but he really wanted to be a farmer. and. Um, we hatched out chicken eggs in our bedrooms as children, with, and he was our brownie troop leader, and we had an orchard in like the Phoenix, Scottsdale area of Arizona, and we had turkeys and geese and rabbits and a dog, and um, we had chicken chores and all that stuff, and we lived in, on an acre in a very urban area, 
And he really instilled from my just my earliest childhood the love of the land and nature and growing things. And my grandmother, too, in Michigan had a big garden. I was born in Michigan. I'm actually born in the Midwest. Um, Farmington, Michigan. I love that. And uh, she had a big iris garden and, and would make pies and we'd pick blueberries down the road and all that. So it, it started really early, this love of land. Um, and I actually have a, a degree in art, a bachelor's in art from UC Santa Cruz, but I look at the land as, as an art project a lot of the time. So um, in 1978, my dad went to Mitchell County in the snow, maybe this time of year, and tried to trot around and bought his first farm up there in the snow. And he learned how to read soil maps. And um, he just kind of got the, the bug of like owning land. And back then, he could somehow make a profit cash running it pr pretty easily. So he'd work more, and then he'd save more, and he'd buy another farm. And he would be really excited to tell us, me and my sister, oh my gosh, I got this farm. And he started taking us to the Iowa State Fair. When I was maybe, you know, 12 or 13 years old, we'd come out here. And it really just kind of got under my skin um, as values of loving the land, even though I don't live here yet. <laughs> So um, this is a collaborative work with uh, Trees Forever, and um, we put some pollinator out there. This is myself on the left, my dad who passed almost two years ago in the center, unfortunately, and my sister Shauna on the right, and we formed a family limited partnership, um, an FLP, in 2012. And I got my first farm income that year. I'd always worked you know, not helping him at all. He was a sole proprietor prior to that. And it was like his baby, you know, it was his farms and he was doing it and everything was fine. And I was photographing weddings professionally for almost 20 years. And, um, and so there we are. Um, this is on our largest farm. And he was really probably my best friend. Um, I was also his caregiver at the end of his life for many years. And we did have hired staff, too. He was in assisted living, but I was with him almost every day. And um, and he would just say, don't sell the farms, don't sell the farms, and and that kind of stuff. So it just, oh, it's just, yeah, it is kind of doing its own timing. Um, and so I would start to come back here as he was starting to get ill health. You know, he was starting to fall down in Iowa. He was falling asleep in the car. Um, and I realized I need to step up and step into this. I got to start looking at the books. Um, I saw that the rents initially were quite low, and we had hired a professional uh, management company, unnamed right now. And um, I could see in their own newsletters that their average cash rents were like way higher than what we were getting, and they were publishing that. So, like, you know, I had some business sensibility. I thought something is really up here. I'm going to get involved. And um, anyway, down the road here, um, this was a really big boost. Um, the NRCS videotaped me and interviewed me on one of the farms. And I started to make conservation a priority. I um, had enough initiative to, we have farms in six Iowa counties. It's a, uh, in one place in South Dakota. There's a total of almost close to 1,700, 1700 acres of 11 farms, so it was a lot to uh, get into. This is one of our operators. And um, my father had never even met an operator in the almost 40 years. He'd only worked with the farm managers and was put in a, you know, a car, probably not even a truck, a sedan, and taken out in August during Iowa State Fair time to view farms from the side of the road. And that's how we always saw the farms like that. So we couldn't, it was like a big tablecloth all over the farm. I couldn't see anything. So everything seemed fine. This is our largest farm here in New Virginia, which is really, really pretty. A lot of conservation ground out there. And, um, and so we just, I got boots on the ground. I got in the NRCS trucks. Uh, they were so wonderful. They took me out to the farms. They drove me out there. They showed me 
wow, you've got some really deep erosion and you should really have a waterway there. We, I was discovering some of the farm buildings that we had that, wow, there's a lot of trees growing around those um, grain bins. I don't think that looks very good. You know, just these are like really easy things for a non-farmer to see that something's wrong. You know, <laughs> and nothing was being ca really cared about much. So I got this in future slides. You'll see this was cleaned up and um, this is our cattle barn. I, my dad didn't even know we still had it. He thought it might have been bulldozed. It was, we were there the wrong time of year to even see it. And suddenly I came in like April or March and it was revealed. And um, I went out there with the contractor and actually helped clear it and stack wood. And I just got so excited to put gloves on and do something because th we had nothing out here. We had no truck, no spade, no nothing. So here's a waterway that needed to be created on the land. There was just, I think in the last five years since I've been involved, there's at least 30 waterways that have been put in on these farms. And it's been everything from CRP waterways, state cost share, a compliance letter with no funding. Um, and then like uh, just hiring a farmer to do it and then learning if you don't have it in CRP, then they farm right through it and plant corn and beans into it. That's not good for a new waterway. <laughs> I learned about silt fence and erosion control blankets and everything was new to me. I mean, I, I just it was just like all foreign language and suddenly I had to learn all of it and get up to speed from California coming out here. I did live in Iowa for about two and a half months in Decatur and that was really helpful. And um, I've enrolled about, uh, there's some more erosion. When I started seeing this erosion then my father allowed me to terminate the management. <laughs> I started showing him pictures like this and I kind of got really angry um, that the land had been treated so cavalier and without thought, even though we were paying, you know, 8% management fees, which seemed like a lot of money. Um, this farm is an 80 acre farm and it got 13 waterways on it. Um, and they were really deep. And so I did get some cost share. That was a really big project. It was really expensive. Um, and now we're getting cover crops on there and I've got two CRP contracts on that farm. And it was overwhelming because I was working on so many farms simultaneously that needed so much attention. And dad, this is prescribed burn. But prior to that, I think it was all tillage that was being done for mid-contract management. But I learned about prescribed burn and how that was actually much better to do and then doing some interseeding as well. Um, I learned about what a diversion was. I learned about how the pond dam shouldn't have trees all in the pond dam. That wasn't healthy. And pretty much all of our pond dams had trees all over them. And um, we didn't even know we had one pond. There was a pond that's like three acres on like the northwest corner on a, the 400 acre farm. Here's the grain, the grain bins cleaned up. Our hunter does this. Uh, mowing for me. I pay him a little bit of money to do that. It's really awesome. And there was just so much discovery. It was very exciting and stressful at the same time. So, but I think my anger and my love of the land and my dad and what he did for our family just propelled me to just work whatever hours I had to work on and look it up online and research it on the iPad to understand what to do. And this is, um, so they were farming right up to the, to the trees, of course. And so on most of the farms now, we have quail buffers on, on, on three sides of the farm. So the butterflies are coming back. The birds are, have habitat. The trees have their root area. Um, the landowner has a place to walk. <laughs> and here's the pond we didn't even know we had, I think. Um, so I had at least out for hunting and I got these pictures back, not that one, but other pictures. I'm like, where's that pond? He's like, it's on your farm. I'm like, really? Wow. Okay. Didn't even know we had that. And so I realized I really had to spend some time out here and get acquainted with all these acres. And, um, 
that's been really successful because boots on the ground, skin in the game, there's just nothing like it. This is in Madison County. Um, this is in the St. Charles area. It's a beautiful pond. Uh, these are developed waterways that um, the Winterset um, NRCS helped me develop. We, they have like one run of tile on them. <laughs> And it just is really going to help clean up that pond water, right? Because it's going to help filter that down there and everything. So um, the types of CRP we have are, um, here's another buffer. We've got quail buffer, pollinator. Uh, we have CRP waterways. We have a duck habitat in the prairie potholes in South Dakota and pheasant habitat. And many other kinds as well. Um, we have one farm that's all in wetland. Um, and as far as uh, the lease provisions, um, we didn't, as a family, ever really have hunting leases. We just thought, well, if we um, don't rent out the farm, then there won't be any hunting, you know, like it'll be preserve. No, <laughs> the neighbors are gonna come in and hunt it. So um, on our biggest farm, I do lease it out. I, we discovered native prairie on some farms. I had Helga Offenberger come out to a couple farms with the um, DNR and um, as the biologist and, and identify native prairie, I, I enrolled the native prairie into conservation. The lease provisions are, you know, um, I actually wrote like a 10 page lease by hybridized about five different leases that I had from various management companies and ISU had two attorneys review it, had my favorite um, honest um, farmer look at it for his perspective. This is all CRP as well. And, um, and it worked out really well so far. Um, I may have to close a loophole of some of the farmers are fertilizing every other year. <laughs> so that's like, I didn't close that loophole yet. I'm gonna work on that one. That's one just has come up for me. But it's really about the proper husbandry, the care of the soil and the trees and the shrubs. This is the North River on one of our farms. Protecting the desirable vegetation. Don't plow or disturb the permanent vegetation. Um, it talks about overspraying or tillage. Um, it talks about when to mow. I did, we didn't even know we had black walnut. This is like amazing black walnut forest. We had never walked in there. It was just like, basically finding like gold coins on the ground, you know, for like a couple of years of just discovery. And um, my dad had asthma and bronchitis and was not an athlete. And so he was not out there hiking. And so once I got, you know, my able body out there, I could, and I got out there with the foresters. This is my sister and her kids. And we're walking in a savanna forest. We didn't even know we had. And we had that restored too with some fish and wildlife money down in Clark County. And um, it's like we're walking in these like national parks, but dad bought it for the family. And it's just, it just blows me away. Um, so we do things like, you know, no fall tillage after soybeans. We had people moldboard plowing. They were doing fall tillage. When I was coming out, we're doing some field days with WFAN and the Xerces Society now with Pollinator. And I would come out and the, it was look like dark chocolate clumps. And I looked like, is this normal? Okay. And then I realized, wow, they're completely ruining <laughs> our farm by doing this. So we went to no-till and the worms are coming back now. I think we've been no-till for like um, five years. Um, and that's really helped. And... I've enrolled, I think I mentioned about 200 acres and 200 more acres into CRP. So we have close to 400 acres of CRP now. So I manage about 30 contracts of CRP personally. Um, I had to hire these contractors to seed it, to um, spray it, to mow it. Um, learning about the better seed companies. I like Hoxie Seed a lot. Uh, they've been really great to deal with. And um, talking about the environmental requirements, the, no chemicals uh, applied beyond the manufacturer's recommendations. Don't don't store or dispose of your chemicals on our farm, please. And um, progress to date, uh, 
we have had three farms that have had cover crops. I definitely want to get them on all the farms. Um, we've used CSP and state cost share funding. I've put in about 30 waterways, and they're all about 30 feet wide, pretty much. Um, the quail buffers around the farm edges. I've enrolled in slough reserve, timber reserve, the savannah restoration, um, soil testing. We had didn't have regular soil testing. We've applied some limestone. We've got some manure application on three farms of chicken and pig. Um, really excited about working with the Xerces folks on the pollinator seedings for the monarch. And um, we had a conservation activity plan done on our largest farm and we're going to be getting hedgerows planted and a large pollinator meadow in front of our cattle barn that you saw. I had two one acre ponds that are 11 feet deep built with equip funded and had a great contractor to do that down in Ringgold County. Um, and a lot of it, just be careful of the 10 year Iowa fence law. This is not talked about much with the surveys. So I've had to survey about six farms uh, because there was either no fence on one side or uh, degraded or something. And we are still in a, a law situation of losing acres. Um, I don't know if it's like one or two acres, but it's, you know, you don't want to lose any acres, right? And um, it's legally expensive. So if you don't have a fence, you know, that's really important to get that rectified right away. Um, future plans. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund uh, is interested in collaborating on our farms for pollinator monarch habitat. They've flown out to California to meet with me. They flew here to Iowa a couple days ago. Uh, they want to just take any odd area we have, like the road ditches, non-CRP waterways, areas around ponds, uh, who knows, stream banks, I'm not sure. And they want to develop seeding plans and, and create habitat where there's just kind of brome grass that's not really doing much. There's really no nectar for those insects out there. So they might want to do some field days, and, and it may be years of collaboration. That's what's been alluded to. I'm super excited about that, um, to partner with, you know, a large nonprofit such as them um, who, is, who are moving in. They are really, um, their initiative is really Iowa and I think Missouri right now. They're coming in from Texas, from doing a lot of pollinator in Texas. Um, I just want to still continue to walk and understand this land, the water, the forests, and what I can do with the idle non-program acres to aid the soil and habitat. And of course, I'd like to start with a section of land and move towards the non-GMO organic practices to work with PFI farmers, beginning farmers, um, some of the farms that we have that actually do have decent fence, maybe getting some livestock out there perhaps, like diversifying this corn, soybean, monoculture. I mean, I live in Santa Cruz, which is the hotbed for organic, so I just I have the mindset for that. Um, and even the, the native bees, the bird nesting boxes, owl boxes, working with beekeepers, and just really being in Iowa a lot more to attend all these great field days that I get all these, you know, notices of that I can't go to because I'm 2,000 miles away. And enjoy the farms recreationally. Um, I just really, I'm really impressed by the beauty of Iowa and want to restore what I can. Um, it's just, I feel very, uh, my heart's really in it. And this is a great, um, PFI is an awesome place to be able to talk about it. So we'll take some questions now, I think. Did you have any problems with the current renters at that time when you were changing over to farming practices and how things were going, how was it going? Yeah, it was really interesting timing because um, we went from a crop share lease to a cash rent lease, kind of right as I was taking on this management. I don't know if we stopped this thing. Um, and uh, some one farmer went bankrupt because he was like leveraging whatever to do the crop share, and he couldn't come up with the cash rent. So he had four farms that year that were relinquished. 
So that old farm manager went and got us new farmers. And so it just so happened I got these young 30-year-old farmers that he got, and I've been working with some of those people. And so there was like this natural changeover that I was fortunate to, you know, inherit. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it's, and then there was another farmer up in Mitchell County that we have two farms up there and one was a stellar farmer and one wasn't. And so I terminated the one that wasn't and gave that stellar farmer the second farm because he'd proved me how great he was. And it, that is a really hard point of all of it. I, I don't want to just cavalierly, you know, get, not have a relationship, but, um, you know, I find that, that some of these newer farmers that are a little younger, they'll text with me and they'll, you know, they'll be on the same page with me and yeah. Yes. Sounds crazy, I know. And most of your leases now are they cash rent? Are they all cash rent? They're all cash rent, and I've been doing one and two year leases because, uh, you know, my father's estate will be divided, and I can't get into long leases right now. But I think once that happens, then I can do more longer term leases, which I think will be really beneficial for the farmers to feel like they're not going to just be there for a year and then, so I, I don't want to get personal but can, is this income important I mean are you do you make it do you is this income important to your family or do you have other needs this is 100 percent my income okay so mm -hmm. that's important mm -hmm. very important because it's easy to do all, all these conservation things that you want to do I mean I have a very similar situation to yours mm -hmm. so similar okay but, yeah Definitely. And I have business cards up here, too, and I love networking. And then Maggie will answer questions, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely quit my other jobs because between caregiving my dad and trying to comprehend what had to happen here and the travel, I mean, I, how could I just go get a part-time job and then have a boss say, no, you got to get permission to fly to Iowa. I mean, I just, I couldn't do it. It was just, yeah. It's 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 some lot, a lot of cost share as much as I can. Um, the ponds, the equip, the CRP. Um, yeah, there was SIP and PIP, the sign up incentives and the program incentives. A lot of that's gone away with this new farm bill, I think. So we were fortunate that we kind of hit a lot of those programs when we did uh, in those years. Well, it's it's like any business. You have to analyze the money coming in. You have base costs, you have property tax, I insurance, um, whatever else. But if you in own any asset, let's say you owned a rental apartment building, you would have to put, you, you would be able to see peeling paint and leaking plumbing. On farms, it's much harder to see. I, I was disabled. I, uh, Besides no voice, <laughs> I have dystonia, which are muscle spasms. I was forced to retire. So I don't have the income I had hoped to have. Um, so that's why we're doing something every year. But there is a lot of money out there, trees forever, um, CRP, CSP, um, also Iowa, REAP. I have a REAP contract for my prairie strips. And the REAP does your forest, right. too. We did a lot of timber right. shed improvements with REAP money. Yeah, there, there's mm -hmm. money, there's EQIP, there's REAP. Also, um, I'm, I'm very supported 
supportive of working lands conservation. CRP is set aside lands. Like, and that means it has to have a cropping history and then you take it out of production. Well, that, I think that's good for where farmers are farming up to the fence line. Take a 20-foot strip out. Because actually, the farmer needs that 20-foot strip to do scouting for pests and, and access to the farm. If they're farming up to the fence line, you can't get in there for six months, eight months. So they're taking all the grass um, borders out. And that's a primary, and that's why I'm doing it. Rather than take away cropland, though, I'm trying to pick and choose those dilapidated fence lines instead of being prone, put it into prairie. Yeah. I do have like a end of my presentation a handout you have. Try to keep these things really quick and just a handout so so you can see where all the work goes on and where things are provided to you if you need to use it. Question? Yeah. I grew up in uh, northern Iowa and of course we have a farm down in southern Iowa now. And there is like you know, like there's some land now that you probably have put in the past. Um, but the head cutting and everything NRCS is going to give you the basics, but if you want to start doing the pizzazz, something that makes it a lot better, then you start putting the plunk pools behind, eight foot deep, the, the fur bearers love it, you get little teeny drops in the water, and you got all kinds of good fish, you can do so many things with these features, and it, I guess if I had renters, we own our own, we don't rent out, but those renters are just a guy, get their wife and get their kids and that's the thought there is put a private area put a little shelter out there put a picnic area that they can go to and then put those pictures of those gullies right there under glassy mm -hmm. and show them what was there before and then that wife sees it the kids have the beaches we got beaches on our stuff we got dots on them you know we got uh, walleye that are reproducing one of the two in Iowa. Wow, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's great. The next pond you put in is going to be a big pool with a waterfall going over it, 15 foot high. And you can do that kind of stuff. And you can bring your friends from California mm -hmm. back, and then you can have something that you can show them. You love the corn, the soybeans, you know, everything there, the fertility. But they're going to maybe want a little more. So you can use those picnic areas that you have and stuff. But those are just some thoughts. That you can do, you can put the pizzazz through that. Mm -hmm. You've got that straight creek going through there, like a little ditch. You probably don't have only the upper part of it. Start putting your pools in, take that dirt out, start oxbowing that stream. You can have fish in there, or have the pool right off the side of it. Mm -hmm. You've got 10 pound northern pike, you know, a lot of stuff is, you can do. You can have those kids fishing all over it. Those two boats be running in the back. There. Mm -hmm. Just some ideas of what you can do. In the, in, the, in, the, in the handout, there was a research study done by the Nature Conservancy by Purdue University. When I read the results, it was about the barriers to conservation on rented land. I was like, because it's mainly pe the people that are um, landowners, non-operator landowners are intimidated by their farmers because they don't feel they understand agriculture. They aren't aware of conservation. They want to have a, here's proof. And here's proof, if you don't know anything about it, but you own the asset, you gotta learn about it. And don't be intimidated and defer to the farm operator. But, and also many of them depend on, they count on getting X dollars a year without thinking about reinvesting. I did a summary of what I've reinvested. I've put 33,000 into tile and terraces, and that's my least favorite conservation, but it was required. I have $9,000 in the riparian buffer, which is filtering PKN. I have um, $1,500 in pollinator plots. Um, $5,600 in cover crops, and my operator did cost share some of that with me. 
And um, so that's about $50,000 in six years. But I figured that into my income. I said, I'm getting X amount of rent. I'm going to set aside five, eight, ten thousand. Now, the terraces, I have a 10 year loan, zero interest loan from IDOLS. So that's there. But every year. Give another question and back e here. Okay, every year okay, I said I saw that nine. hand, and then we have another hand. Okay. Or Yeah, I have, uh, so this farm in St. Charles that had the pond with the waterway going down to it uh, was a dairy farm. And the only way I found that out was that the surveyor himself worked on the dairy farm <laughs> and told me that. <laughs> so um, it has good fence, thank goodness, because the farmer had asked, can I rip that fence out? And somewhere along the line, it didn't happen and there's good fence. So that's that low-lying fruit of the infrastructure that's there. And I would love to see cows out there and some diversifi diversification. Yeah. So I've been talking to Silt, not to give them the farm, but to work with their NRCS guy, Joe, who's been at their table. And um, he's on like a five-year grant with NRCS that he will go out and walk farms with you and um, talk about other kinds of crops rather than the monoculture that we have. So I'm, I got his number, and we're going to talk about that. And we want to put livestock on, but most of our fences are dilapidated. So we're deciding what we do. Um, temporary electron, you know, solar-powered electric fence that we could move and do um, that, or are we going to build fence? And we're working with Joe, too. Oh, good. And then there was another question back here, and then I think we're about out, out of time at that. So you're a farmer? Yeah. Okay, let's talk. No, I <laughs> come take my card. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you too. <laughs> yeah, we're we're faced with we're we're faced with the issue of we've had our our operator for twenty one years. They're almost like family. But if we can't go further with our conservation plans, we may be faced at looking somewhere else. And I've just heard about a young farmer that in the area that's doing non-GMO, organic, um, cover crops, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, what do I do? But it'd be almost like getting rid of part of our family. So we're trying to figure that out. Yeah. Another question? scoop all the dirt into those gullies so they can get the combine moved up. But if you've got neighbors that are really bad, go Google Earth, turn them in, it's anonymous. Mm. Get rid of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Do it. Well, if you don't do it, don't, don't put up with it. One, one of my biggest problems, our biggest problems, three, three sides of our farm are owned by the largest farmer in our county who that's fungicide, pesticide, corn on corn, all this stuff. I can't find him. I mean, he's too big. I mean, he owns the county. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, he doesn't. But but it's really tough. <laughs> it's it's re it's really tough to fight that. But we're. I doing think we're going to hang out up here up front for a little bit. If you want to come up. <laughs>